how's everybody doing? It's great to be here in Wisconsin. I assume you can hear me okay, right? Well, I've traveled a long way to be here for one very important reason. I think a man has emerged in our politics that's going to save this country and really turn things around. He's a man who doesn't mince words. He's somebody we can get behind. I'm talking about Donald Trump. I think he's going to save the entire country. Well, if I could be a little bit more serious than that, I think Donald Trump might be old news even by now, and that's a good thing for sure. We hear an awful lot, and being here in Wisconsin, your situation with Scott Walker, and a lot of people are upset at Scott Walker, and y'all certainly know a lot about that, more about that than I do, me being in South Carolina. We hear that those who want to cut government, cut spending, are too extreme. Don't we hear that all the time? There's just these crazy Tea Party extremists. Now, when I think of the word extreme, which usually has a negative connotation, I think first and foremost of Barry Goldwater. You remember his famous extremism in the defense of liberty. And uh, it was very popular with a lot of conservatives in 1964, and unfortunately was not popular with a lot of Americans in 1964, and he did not win that election. But it's worth remembering extremism, we're always called the people in this room. If you belong to the Tea Party, and you worry about the national debt and the size of government, you're too extreme. You're just, there's something wrong with you. You're crazy. You're dangerous. Well, I want to talk about two forms of extremism. You have the Barry Goldwater, Tea Party, sort of Ron Paul extremism in wanting to cut government. And then you have the status quo in Washington, D.C., in the American body politic. The extremism that says that a $14 trillion debt it's something we should be concerned about, but not as, mu as much as we should be concerned about these Tea Partiers. The sort of extremism I'm talking about is when your own Paul Ryan can introduce a plan, his path to prosperity, and everybody starts freaking out like the world's going to come to an end. Paul Ryan's plan decreases the rate of growth of spending. It's not an actual cut. In 10 years, we will have not a $14 trillion debt, but a $23 trillion national debt under Paul Ryan's plan. I think that's pretty extreme. I don't know if most of you do. And then, of course, you've got the most extreme status quo. If Paul Ryan, you know, the mainstream thinks Paul Ryan's just out of his gourd. He's too extreme. That's crazy. You've got Barack Obama, who, in wanting to address the debt in our deficit, would leave us, according to the Congressional Budget Office's own numbers, all the projections, all the things he's promised, in 10 years, a $41 trillion national debt. That's in 10 years. Now, it is said that those of us in this room who might support a guy like Ron Paul or his son Rand Paul, or who might go to a tea party, who are concerned that our children and grandchildren might be saddled with a $14 trillion national debt, or a, heaven forbid, $23 trillion national debt, or even worse, or worse a $41 trillion national debt, that there's something wrong with us in wanting to cut that. If you, I, I, unfortunately I wasn't here all day, but I bet you a dime to a dollar if you had every speaker that lined up and spoke here today, and it was covered by Rachel Maddow and Chris Matthews and Maureen Dow in the New York Times, they would say, this is a, a room full of loons. These are a bunch of crazy people. And we, you know, say, y'all are okay with, y'all, I'm from South Carolina, you have to put it with <laughs> are okay with a $14 trillion national debt. They'll say, no, we want to address it. No, you don't. No, you don't. You're not saying anything that would change that. You're comfortable, uncomfortable with a $23 trillion national debt. You think Paul Ryan goes too far. And you're certainly comfortable with a $41 trillion national debt. That is far more extreme than talking about, as our last speaker said, the Second Amendment. What's wrong with sticking with the Second Amendment? What's wrong with the Tenth Amendment? What's wrong with wanting to cut a $14 trillion national debt? What's wrong with revisiting the Constitution as the Republican Party did up until the year 2000 and saying, we don't need a Department of Education? I was on the plane flying here. I was coming out of O'Hare, and I had Tom Wood's book, Rollback. I'm sure many of you have read it here in this audience. And a gentleman behind me, who I assume was sort of not on the the right or conservative or libertarian side of things asked me a very innocent question. He said, roll back? Roll back what? I said, well, roll back big government. It's a pretty big problem these days, sir. You know. He said, well, what would you start with? 
I said, well, that's a very good question. I'm here at the airport, so the TSA would probably be the, you know, the, the most popular choice. But I gave him a more honest answer than that. I said, the Department of Education. It's unpopular across the board. I don't know a teacher that's a big fan of No Child Left Behind and all that kind of stuff, at least the ones I know in South Carolina. I know you had a different situation with a lot of teachers up here with Scott Walker and whatnot. But I would start there because it's a, it's a department that wasn't, didn't come about until 1980. It's a good place to start saving money, and then we could start looking at all sorts of different places to cut. What would you replace it with, he said. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing at all, that's the point. His view and his mind is the status quo, it's the respectable opinion, and I'm the wacko, I'm the weirdo, I'm the crazy. We need to remind these people, and they will be reminded, whether we do it or just the, you know, the basic math and the reality of their economics slaps them in the face, that they are the extremists. They are, and they need to be reminded of that every chance we get. Well. You had the situation here with Scott Walker and you, the big brouhaha. Was that not a lot of it about some people not understanding that our economic realities have changed? Is that a good way to sort of summarize what happened here? Reality slapping them in the face. You have a governor who's attempting to do something about it and everybody freaking out. Well, we're going to start to see a lot more of that. And what I'm interested in, in talking about these two extremes, is how we're perceived and how there's a double standard. I'm going to read to you right now. These are two gentlemen who wrote in the Wall Street Journal in March. You know, we've heard a lot about the Tea Partiers uh, uh, having signs that might be racist or too extreme or incites violence or something. Well, haven't we heard that? Every Tea Party is just a bunch of, you know, secret crazy people, so on and so on, if you listen to Chris Matthews in New York Times. This is a gentleman named Rich Noyes and Scott Whitlock describing the scenes here that y'all witnessed in Wisconsin as it relates to Scott Walker. And I'm telling you this to make a point. From the Wall Street Journal, quote, over the past several days, the liberal demonstrations in Wisconsin, bolstered by the National Democratic Party and President Obama's Organizing for America group, that sounds pretty ominous, have included signs just as inflammatory as the ones that bothered the networks during the health care debate, and they most certainly did. Some of these signs included several showing Governor Scott Walker is Adolf Hitler, others of Lycan Walker to Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin, and recently deposed, and this was one of the funniest ones to me, Egyptian autocrat Hosni Mubarak. Do you all remember those signs that Scott Walker's Hosni Mubarak? Another protest sign drew a crosshairs over picture, a picture of Governor Walker's head with the caption, Don't retreat, re, excuse me, yeah, don't retreat, reload, repeal Walker. And with the Gifford situation, remember we heard about Sarah Palin and her ads and so on and so on. And the gentleman in the Wall Street Journal point out that that particular poster contained a graphic that placed target sites in, on maps of congressional district. Excuse me, that's a Sarah Palin example, but that particular graphic had a target over Scott Walker's face. Now, the reason I bring that up is, and you could also compare this this week with Paul Ryan's plan. Have you seen the town halls where some of the people were saying, you're taking away my Medicaid and Medicare, which is not true, but they're screaming and yelling. How much are you hearing from the left, or even the establishment Republican right? I know I'm with friends here in this room. We know they're both part of the same problem. How much are you hearing that the people who were protesting here in Wisconsin against Scott Walker were extremists? Like you hear about the Tea Party or Ron Paul follower. You really don't hear that. Why? Because the mainstream media basically agrees with them. Are you hearing that these people who are at these town halls this week who are saying that Paul Ryan's taking our Medicare and taking our Medicaid, are you hearing Chris Matthews every night say, well, look at these extremists, these crazy people at these town halls who can't be civil? You heard that from Maureen Dowd. Have you heard that from Frank Rich at the New York Times who have said all sorts of awful things about the Tea Partiers and grassroots conservatives and libertarians? No. Why? Because they agree with them. That brings me back to my point. If we have extremism in our ranks, according to them, because we want to cut government, they are not only just as extreme in what they tolerate, a $14 trillion national debt. If you listen to Obama, $41 trillion. Let's invert the number. But they are tolerant of the same behavior in support of their ideology. It's complete hypocrisy, and we need to throw it back in their face every chance they get, because they are no different. Completely. Not at all. Now, I want to talk a little bit about moving forward and how we can actually cut government. We all want to do it. What are the political 
uh, practical la practicalities. What is what in the future are we going? How are we going to actually cut government? If Paul Ryan's you know plan is a bridge too far, how are we going to cut government in a way that doesn't equal twenty three trillion dollars? Well, Senator Rand Paul, who I spent some time with on the road, was happy to accompany him in putting together the Tea Party Goes to Washington, his book, has proposed this year $500 billion in cuts just this year. That addresses one-third of this year's deficit. We have a $1.5 trillion deficit. What is the reaction in Washington, D.C.? Well, of course, the Democrats and the liberals think it's, that's just crazy. You can't do that. That's nuts. What's the reaction from the Republicans? Well, he has two co-sponsors, Jim DeMint and Mike Lee. And the rest of the party are like, we're going to hang out with Paul Ryan. That's too extreme, Rand Paul. And nothing against Paul Ryan. His is better than Barack Obama's, but hell, a $23 trillion debt is still, you know, too much. Now, I bring that up. If Rand Paul addressing one-third of this year's deficit is too extreme, what are we talking about? What is every Republican, except for one, running for president this year talking about when they get up there and say, if Newt Gingrich or Mitt Romney beat their chest and say, I'm the Tea Party candidate, I tell you what, I'm going to cut government, I can hear what the grassroots are telling me, what are they saying? Are they serious? That's exactly right. Now, the difference this time around, we all remember when Ron Paul ran for president in 2007 and 2008. He was saying the same things that the Tea Partiers are now. He was saying we have an unsustainable economy, we have an unsustainable status quo, we have a government that is too big, it oppresses our liberties, it, it takes money from our children and grandchildren, everything across the board you could possibly imagine. It's bad for this country, it's happening right now. And he was called too extreme, you know, it's too far out there, you run on your foreign policy, you're cra Well, it's a different situation this time around. Virtually everybody you're going to see, I'm going to be at this debate in Greenville, South Carolina next Thursday, this first Republican debate. You're going to see a lot more guys who used to beat up on Ron Paul trying to sound like Ron Paul. That's exactly true. Now, the reason for that is they just want to win their offices. They want to be the next president. So, you know, if it, it, was, it was cool to talk like Joe Lieberman at the 2008 Republican convention, they'd talk like that. It's cool to talk like Ron Paul in 2012, they're going to talk like that. The difference is he's consistent. And the difference is many in the Tea Party can see through the BS at this point, quite frankly. Ask Mike Lee's uh, predecessor there in Utah, Bob Bennett. Bob Bennett's a good, solid, conservative Republican. He's not going anywhere. Well, think again, Bob Bennett, you're gone. And put Mike Lee in there. Now, I bring up an example like that. Let's look at Kentucky. Trey Grayson, endorsed by Dick Cheney, Rudy Giuliani, Rick Santorum, all these good conservative Republicans in their own minds, at least. Rand Paul's the new senator from Kentucky. They never saw that coming. Mitch McConnell did not want that to happen. Believe me, I saw it firsthand. That's the different political environment we find ourselves in. Now, I agree with what Sheriff Back said earlier. There's a lot of things that Washington, D.C. is not going to be able to fix. But there is a political mindset in this country where things that we used to think were too extreme are now mainstream. Who was talking about the Federal Reserve and the problems it causes in 2006 and 2007? To my recollection, it was one guy. Peter Schiff, that's true. That's true, who was Ron Paul's economic advisor. But in the mainstream, the popular figures we all know, there was one guy, most people didn't even know who Ron Paul was at that time. Now he's a household name. Who's talking about the Federal Reserve now? You can't find a conservative Republican who's a big fan of Ben Bernanke and the Federal Reserve. For the first time, Ben Bernanke has become, or the Federal Reserve chairman, period, has become a political figure. And that institution has become a political target. Why do you think Ben Bernanke gave a press conference this week? That's exactly right. The political environment has changed. We all know about the Politico poll that was taken, oh, I don't know, a couple months ago, and it showed that just as many Americans identify with the Tea Party as they do with the two major parties. We have this situation recently. We're talking about the debate over raising the debt ceiling. Polls are showing that a majority of Americans think we should not raise the debt ceiling. 
I saw Chris Matthews last week saying, what is wrong with these Americans? Are they crazy? We have to raise the debt ceiling. These rubes out there in the hinterlands, what, what are they thinking? We have to raise the debt ceiling. It is the responsible thing to do. They can't see the writing on the wall. Who was talking about, what, who was considered too extreme for even suggesting that a few years ago? Ron Paul, you see what I'm getting at. Now, you know, a lot of people, especially our Republican friends or conservative friends, like to beat up on people like me and the people in this room and saying, well, that's just those Ron Paul people. Well, everybody on that stage this Thursday night in Greenville is going to sound a lot like a bunch of Ron Paul people, and it seems like they're coming our way and we're winning. Now, why that's important is, if we're really going to turn this country around, we have to have a revolution in our minds and our politics as much as anything else. Things that used to be considered too extreme must become mainstream. Not raising the debt ceiling three or four years ago, I argued, argued with Lindsey Graham about it on our radio station in Charleston, South Carolina. He thought that was too extreme. Now, he just keeps his mouth shut because everybody else is saying the exact opposite. Talking about the Federal Reserve, that's what some gold bug crank might bring up, we heard a couple years ago, right? Now everybody's talking about it. You got Jim DeMint in the Senate sponsoring audit the Federal Reserve legislation, of course, Ron Paul, and everybody's talking about the Federal Reserve. Across the board, Americans, many of them who voted for Barack Obama because they were fed up with George W. Bush, and rightfully so, fear the national debt. If you look at the polling, they are just as scared as the national debt as the most conservative Republican you could find. Now, the problem is, when you ask them, well, how are we going to fix that? Well, yeah, let's cut the, oh, well, we can't do that. You ask your average Republican, well, how are we going to fix that? Well, we're going to get Pentagon spending. Oh, you can't do that. The hardcore ideologues on both sides, there's parts of our big government, of statism, if you will, that they don't want to touch. But I say to you, more than ever in American politics, more Americans than ever are willing to seriously consider this stuff. When Ron Paul is on that debate stage Thursday night and he's telling a Republican audience that we shouldn't be in Libya because it's a bad idea and it costs too much money, he's not going to get a chorus of boos like he did in 2008. He's not. Many conservatives think that's a bad idea. They don't agree with John McCain that we need to be over there. Who supports Al-Qaeda, by the way? I don't know if y'all have heard about this. John McCain is now openly supporting Al-Qaeda, but I, I've said that on my radio show. People thought I was kidding. No, the Libyan rebel leaders have said that Al-Qaeda or their fellow freedom fighters and so on and so on, that's who John McCain wants to give military aid money to. That's how much the world has changed just in a, f a few years, and I'm talking about the political world, to get people to think differently about things. It was what Rudy Giuliani used against Ron Paul the first time around, his foreign policy views. You can't hold those views. Well, not only does he still have those views, but more Republicans are coming around and more Americans are. They're not as controversial as they used to be. How many Americans do you know, right, left, Republican, Democrat, think it's a good idea that we're in Libya right now? Very few. In fact, the most strident ones are some of my Democrat friends who just get so ticked off when I point out the many ways in which Barack Obama's like George W. Bush. <laughs> they tell me, Jack, you don't understand. Libya's different. I said, stop right there. So you're telling me, before we continue this conversation, I'll listen to what you have to say, that if George W. Bush did exactly what Barack Obama did in Libya, my Democrat friend, you would have supported it. And they know that's not true. They know damn well that's not true. We're calling out hypocrisy on both sides. They are the extreme. Our foreign policy is extreme. The idea that we're going to start to stay home more often and save our money and have a proper defense, not an irrational offense, is not extreme. And more Americans than ever are starting to agree with that, that it's the right thing to do. Well, you know, a lot of people say that the GOP, as it's tinged by the Tea Party and these crazy Ron Paul people, is the party of no. They should be the party of no. That's the entire point. Every talk radio host I've heard for my entire, I'm 36 years old, I grew up on talk radio, Limbaugh, Hannity, all those guys, and, uh, you know, I've heard that the Democrats and the liberals are taking this country down the wrong path. They're spending too much money. Well, how do you stop that? You have to have a serious opposition to it, a loyal opposition to it. We don't have any opposition to it, at least not to this point. 
George W. Bush spent more money than Bill Clinton did. I tell my conservative friends who still have some sort of affection for George W. Bush for reasons I can't figure out. I tell them, if you base conservatism by the size and scope of government, how much we spend, Bill Clinton is to the right and more conservative than George W. Bush. That's absolutely true. I'm not even laughing if that's what you base it on. If they base it on partisan nonsense, which is the reason we have a George W. Bush, and you supported him when he expanded the Department of Education with No Child Left Behind, when he gave us the largest entitlement expansion since Linda B. Johnson with Medicare Plan D, when he got us involved in Iraq, which cost about $3 trillion when you add it all up, and it's not the stuff that they just keep off the books, when Barney Frank says now we could pay for Obamacare if we weren't in Iraq, should a conservative say, no, Mr. Frank, we need to spend a trillion dollars overseas but never at home, or should a serious conservative or libertarian or constitutionalist say, we don't have the money to be spending a trillion dollars, period. More Americans are willing to say, you don't spend it, period. The neoconservatives, the John McCains, all those guys that beat up on Ron Paul, they're yesterday's news and they know it. There's not a bunch of Americans saying, boy, I'm glad John McCain's over there in Libya and doing something good for this country. They're like, what in the hell is John McCain doing over in Libya and what's he doing to this country? And John McCain's always been that guy. I remember during the campaign, do you remember when we had the conflict over there with Russia and Georgia, the South Ossetia situation? And John McCain famously said, we're all Georgians now. I don't know one American besides John McCain who felt some sort of kinship with the people in Georgia. And the subtext of that is we need to be there. The subtext of what he's doing now is we need to be in Libya, in Syria, in Pakistan, in Yemen, Iran, North Korea. That's the point. Americans are fed up with that, and more conservatives and people in the Republican Party are fed up with that than you could possibly imagine. It's an extremism that is the status quo, and people are getting sick of it. They don't want to raise the dead ceiling. They don't want to be the world's policemen. Things are trending our way. Thursday night at that debate is going to be a very good indication of that. When Ron Paul announced in 2006 or 2007 that he was running for president, he didn't get the sort of full court press we saw this week when he announced in Iowa. Nobody knew who in the hell he was. No idea whatsoever. He is a household name, and for all the right reasons. Now, we, Ron Paul, Rand Paul, I often refer to ourselves as constitutional conservatives. I'm very comfortable with that term. It does two things. We all support the Constitution. And George W. Bush called himself a conservative. Well, who wants to be associated with that? It distinguishes us. We are constitutional conservatives, a libertarian, whatever you want to call it. Now, what that means is we are serious about cutting government. We are serious about changing the status quo. The line in the next election will not be drawn between those bad Democrats who just now have taken us over the cliff and the Republicans who are going to save us. But thanks to the party, Tea Party, thanks to the influence of guys like Ron Paul, the line is going to be between the same old Republican hacks who have no record to back up the fact that they're now saying they're going to cut government and cut spending and do this, that, and the other, and the people who mean it. The people who mean it are very short supply, and Ron Paul's probably the most prominent one. More Americans than ever are not only beginning to see that, but are waking up to it and are excited about it. Things are trending our way. I use the term constitutional conservative because this all ties back when we hear from our Republican mainstream sort of critics who say, you guys are crazy, you're just outside, you're too extreme, it's too much, you're, you're not real Republicans or real conservatives. I use Barry Goldwater. Since when has Barry Goldwater not been the standard for American conservatives? He was a long time before me, but when I think of the pure, unadulterated American conservative philosophy, I think of Barry Goldwater. Well, tell me if this sounds closer to Mitt Romney, Rick Santorum, Newt Gingrich even? Or does it sound closer to Ron Paul? Here's a quote from Goldwater, 1964. I want to leave you with this. This should be the philosophy for, philosophy for not only everybody in this room, but everybody in this movement and everybody in the Tea Party who plans on voting for Ron Paul, who supports people who want to get back to the Constitution, who want to nullify laws that we don't need in the federal government, so on and so on. This should be our mantra. This is Barry Goldwater in 1964. He was right then and he's right today in 2012. The turn will come when we entrust the conduct of our affairs to the men who understand that their first duty as public officials is to divest themselves of the power that they have been given.
It will come when Americans in hundreds of communities throughout the nation decide to put the man in office who has pledged to enforce the Constitution and restore the Republic. Who will proclaim in a campaign speech, I have little interest in streamlining government or in making it more efficient, for I mean to reduce its size. I do not undertake to promote welfare, for I propose to extend freedom. My aim is not to pass laws, but to repeal them. It is not to inaugurate new programs, but to, but to cancel the old ones that do violence to the Constitution, or that have failed in their purpose, or that impose on the people an unwarranted financial burden. This is all custom made for today. Continues Goldwater, I will not attempt to discover whether legislation is needed before I have first determined whether it is constitutionally permissible. And if I should later be attacked for neglecting my constituents' interest, I shall reply that I was informed that their main interest is liberty and that in that cause I'm doing the very best I can. I appreciate being with you all here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.